Welcome back to our walk through the Bible. This time we are in the book of Nehemiah, named after the main character, a man of faith and prayer and courage and action. And in the book of Nehemiah, there are leadership principles that just come jumping out after us in, in every page. Uh, along with the book of Joshua, Nehemiah is one of the premier books on leadership in all of the Old Testament. And it really uh, affirms the principle that leadership is action. Leadership is a verb. It's action, not position. With position comes responsibility. And Nehemiah shows that it is prayer and it's courage, it's faith, it's action that makes the difference. As we mentioned last time with the book of Ezra, the two books, Ezra and Nehemiah, in the Hebrew Scriptures were combined. There was no break between Ezra 10 and Nehemiah chapter 1. And we are continuing this post-exilic history uh, with the Jews who have returned to Jerusalem and, Ju and Judah uh, as they are in the work of restoration and reviving. So the first of three returns was in Ezra. That was at 536 B.C. under the leadership of Zerubbabel, where the focus was on rebuilding the temple. Then the second return, also in the book of Ezra, was that of Ezra himself, the priest, the scribe, who returned in 488 B.C. And his ministry was calling people to repentance. So we might say the rebuilding of lives. And now in the book of Nehemiah, we are coming to the third return, that of Nehemiah himself in 444 uh, B.C. So we're introduced to him while he's still in Persia, serving as cupbearer to the king. And he has asked a question from one of the Jews who had been to Jerusalem and had returned back to Persia. He said, How, how's everyone doing? And the report was bad. And so our introduction to him is that he is struck by this. We want to mention his emotions a little bit more here in a few minutes. But that really was the impetus for uh, his return, was hearing how the people were in great distress and reproach. So his return is going to be the rebuilding of the walls. So we have the rebuilding of the temple, the ongoing work of rebuilding the lives with Ezra, and he's going to continue that work in the book of Nehemiah. And then we have Nehemiah himself who focuses on rebuilding the walls. Uh, he'll actually return back to Persia for um, a, a period of time, about a year, uh, after 11 years, and, uh, and then come back to Jerusalem, and we'll pick up with some of his comments there in chapter 13. So as far as the historical timeline of the Old Testament, we're very late in the recorded history of the, of the Old Testament. Along with Malachi, uh, the book of Nehemiah is taking us to the end of that period before we have some 400 years of prophetic silence before the coming of the Messiah. So a two-point outline of the book of Nehemiah would be, uh, number one, the reconstruction of the walls, as chapters 1 through 6, and then the restructuring or the restoration of the people, and that is chapters 7 through 13. So consider with me a, uh, a, the four steps that are evident with Nehemiah when it came to the rebuilding of the walls. Uh, the first step was prayer. As he is filled with emotion, as he is weeping over the report, uh, he goes into a period of fasting and prayer. He's getting God involved in this situation. That's in chapter 1 and verse 4. And along with prayer, with Nehemiah, we see throughout the book comes confession. Now again, we're some 94 years after the first return, but there's still a confession of the sins of the people down in verse 6, realizing that this is why they were in this situation in the first place, was because of their sins. So he's confessing this to God, he's petitioning God uh, there in, in chapter 1, filled with emotions. He's not holding back his emotions. You know, what you grieve over speaks volumes as to what is important to you. Um, we, he did not go around as a person who wore his feelings on his sleeves if he was a cupbearer to the king, because the king wanted everyone around him to be happy. But this is something that was worthy of grieving over, that being the condition of his people. So when the king notices some four months later 
uh, his change in disposition. He'll ask him, what do you want me to do about it? And Nehemiah again prays. And all of the prayers that are listed in Nehemiah, some eight prayers, they're all short. He's just coming to God on the spot, getting him involved. So the first step, first leadership principle that we see in the rebuilding of the walls is prayer. The second step is fact-finding. And we see that in chapter 2. Uh, Nehemiah is not just going to take the report and run with it. Uh, he's going to go and see for himself, get firsthand information. He's not going to operate on hearsay. And so he will go to Jerusalem. He'll inspect the walls. He doesn't tell people what he's thinking about doing at that place. That's a great leadership principle. Do your homework. So we've got prayer. We've got this fact-finding. And then the third step being that of motivation. And so in verse 18, he begins to tell the people that this is a God thing. Yes, it's walls, it's brick and mortar, but it's going to be a God thing because God has already put his hand of favor upon him. And remember we talked in the book of Ezra the, how hands is used with encouragement and discouragement. When you're encouraging someone, you're strengthening their hands. When you're discouraging them, you're weakening their hands. But regardless of how people are treating you, there is the hand of God. And that's what Nehemiah is focusing on, the hand of God. He had been favorable to him. And so they say in chapter 2 and verse 18, let's go to it. Let's arise and build. Uh, he has sufficiently motivated the people where now they are ready to do what they had not done all these years. One man can make a difference. Uh, one person who is coming with God and with a passion for the work can make a tremendous difference. And what I like in chapter 3 is the listing. It seems kind of boring to us when we go through all the names. But chapter 3 is a remarkable chapter in that it shows the diversity of people working on the walls. They are utilizing their gifts for God. And that's what a leader does even in the church today is they are allowing space for people to use their gifts for God's glory. So we've got prayer, we've got fact-finding, we've got motivation, and then the fourth step is perseverance. Because whenever God's people say, let us arise and build, the enemy is going to say, let us arise and oppose. And so we have external opposition. Uh, people who would not normally be friends that are coming up against the Jews, they're united in their cause of opposition. So we see that in chapter, well, a little bit of it there even in chapter 2. But in chapter 4, and uh, verses 4 and 5, Nehemiah responds to the opposition with prayer. And it's not really a nice prayer of, God, be nice to these people. It's certainly not a prayer like Stephen or Jesus, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Uh, Nehemiah is praying for God to, to bring some hard times upon these people, to say the least. So he, he responds to the opposition with prayer and then action. Uh, they're they're going to press forward with this in verse 6. So we built the wall. Now that's in contrast to the book of Ezra where we saw Zerubbabel and Jeshua uh, cease the work when the opposition uh, was bad. Of course, there were accusations. There was a decree uh, from the king to stop, but uh, Nehemiah is not letting this opposition stop him. So that's the first wave of opposition. And then we have another wave in verse 8, uh, the, the, verses 7 and 8. And so what does Nehemiah do? He does exactly what you and I need to do when we're facing opposition in hard times, when we're facing challenges, when we're tempted to say, okay, well, that's a closed door. Now, that door could be wide open. It's just that there's a testing to see how committed you are to going through that open door. What does he do there in verse 9? They pray again. Pray again and set up their guard and get to work. So it really brings up an interesting question for you and and, and I individually, what are we doing when opposition comes our way? Do we just throw up our hands? Do we say, well, okay, I tried. Nehemiah says, you pray and then you get to work. And you press forward if it is a God-ordained task that you've been called to. And because they do that, in verses 14 and 15 of chapter 4, God is the one that's receiving the glory. See, sometimes the, the tougher the opposition is, the greater the victory is going to be and then God is going to receive the honor as he ought to. So there's external opposition, but then there is internal opposition in chapter 5. 
God's people are, are, are kind of turning on themselves and they're taking each other into slavery. They're, uh, they're mortgaging uh, their houses and, and, and there's a shortage of food. It's just a real desperate situation. And rather than working together on the same team, they're turning against each other. And what we see beginning in verse 6 is that Nehemiah gets very angry about this. He, uh, he confronts it. And sometimes leaders have to do that. They have to say, this just isn't right. This is not how God's people ought to be. And so he points out specifically what the problem is in verse 7. And then he demonstrates himself uh, a different model as their governor beginning in chapter 14. So he's not just confronting the problem and then stepping away. He's confronting it, and then he's taking specific steps to show a better way of interacting with each other and of accomplishing uh, this work. And then there is a third uh, part of, of opposition, and that comes in the form of plans to harm Nehemiah himself in chapter 6. And uh, what does Nehemiah do when he finds out about that? Look at verse 9, the second part of, of verse 9. He cries out, O Lord, strengthen my hands. And we think about in the New Testament how often the, the same thing happened with Paul. That if it couldn't stop the movement, well, we'll just stop Paul. And that's kind of what's going on here with Nehemiah as well. Okay, well, they're going to keep working, but now let's target Nehemiah. Let's take out the leader. So he prays to God to strengthen his hands. They keep working and the result is in chapter 6 and verse 15 the wall is completed with the help of God. It's chapter 6 and verse 15 and it was a, uh, finished in, in AD 5, 16. Kind of an interesting play there on the numbers and uh, it's completed in just 52 days. That really shows uh, what can happen when there's a, a, a singular purpose. You know, Nehemiah, there's other things he could have could have got caught up in. He could have said, well, let's go over here and do some remodeling on this temple. It's not quite as beautiful as, as Solomon's. He could have gone over here and got caught up in other projects, but he came to rebuild the wall, and he did. Under his leadership, in just 52 days, he did what had not been accomplished in some 92 to 94 years before that. So chapters 1 through 6 is the rebuilding of the wall, and then the second half of the book is the continuing work of rebuilding lives, the restoration of the people, chapters 7 through 13. And quickly, there are four key elements in this that are still true today. The first one is the role of teaching God's people. Chapter 8 is, uh, is, is just this uh, wonderful passage on what happens when God's Word is being taught and hearts are receiving his word and being convicted by his word. Ezra is taking on, as we mentioned last time, a, a, a modified role of the scribe. Don't think of scribes as just over here being like a Xerox and they're copying down the law. He's up there and he's teaching the people and they're being convicted of their sins. That's going on in chapter 8. Well, the second key element in restoration is then worship. So we have the teaching of God's word the response of worship in verse 6. They're crying out, Amen, Amen. They're lifting up their hands, they're bowing down, and they're worshiping God. So it's, it's not simply a cerebral experience of, of hearing the Word of God. It's, it's coming into their heart, and they are responding. Amen, so be it, we'll do it. And uh, it's just this wonderful scene of emotion as the men and the women and those who were old enough to understand we're hearing the word of God taught. And they observe the Feast of Tabernacles as a part of this worship as well. Then the third key element in the restoration of the people that we see in this passage is in chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, an element that we've already mentioned before, and that being confession. You know, if we hear the word of God and, and, and we worship God, but, but we never get real with God and confess our sins, and we're missing out on a key element that's necessary for repentance and restoration and renewal. And so there is this confession of what they have done and, and, and that they're going to have to separate themselves from the foreign people who have been pulling their hearts away from God. And this separation meant the, the division of families. Uh, as I mentioned last week, it's, it's really some difficult things to read about families splitting up, but, 
This isn't about, this intermarriage problem isn't about race, it's about religion. And if God's people are going to renew their covenant with him, then they must step away from that temptation to worship the foreign gods. So there's confession taking place in the first three verses of chapter 9. And then the fourth key element in restoration is that of action. And this is where Nehemiah, after he's been gone for a little over a year, he comes back. And in chapter 13, he is calling for action uh, for people to indeed separate from the foreigners. Uh, they're also uh, kicking out Tobiah, who was given a room at the temple, a room that was supposed to be for the, the tithes and everything. So he's confronting that. He's uh, doing what is necessary to, uh, to become uh, God's people in covenant with him. And then I, I want us to wrap up with verse 18 because it really sums up what we've said so many times about why they're in this place. He says, chapter 13, verse 18, Did not your fathers do the same so that our God brought on us and on this city all this trouble? Yet you were adding to the wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. He's reminding them, look at where we were and what we went through. And now you're doing the same thing, specifically in that context, by not keeping the Sabbath. So this is a key part of restoration, is remembering what uh, got them there in the first place. So a lot of key leadership principles in uh, the book of Nehemiah, and we're going to discuss uh, three of these with our guest for today. I'd like to welcome Quadric Brumfield to our discussion on Nehemiah. Welcome, Quad. Yeah, good to be here. Thank you. Good to have you with us. Yeah. We appreciate all you do at Sylvan Hills and especially your work as a shepherd. Uh, we know that uh, that comes with many responsibilities, mm -hmm. so much that the rest of us don't know about, and we appreciate your work. Yes, sir. Thank it's you. a good work. Thank you. Well, as we think about Nehemiah, there are a lot of leadership principles, and certainly one of them that uh, we need to discuss is that of opposition. If we're thinking that any good work is going to be accomplished without opposition, we're wrong, aren't we? That's right. That's right. Yeah, opposition does some amazing things. Um, sometimes as, as people, we only see the hardship, right? That's mm -hmm. the thing that, that gets us um, burdened down, um, downtrodden, just discouraged. Um, but uh, as we look at Nehemiah, it is though he needed opposition. That, that solidified his, his journey in God as, after he'd accepted the task to go back and, and rebuild the city. It, the story wouldn't have been the same without the opposition, without Sam Ballard and Tobias and those guys just trying to, to get in the way. So I think that if we look at it as Christians from that perspective, it certainly shapes my heart a little bit better. Um, pain is pain no matter how you look at it, but if you can um, reshape that pain to understand that there, there can be some strength uh, built uh, in the midst of pain, then that should help out it, a little it bit. It really fired him up. It did. Now this is a guy that in chapter one was grieving mm -hmm. and sad over the report, but mm -hmm. when he got on the scene, mm -hmm. He was intense. He was passionate. His prayer, <laughs> his prayer uh, uh, against, I mean, there's no other way of saying it. It wasn't for the enemies. It was against, against the enemies. enemies. It really showed a, a lot of passion uh, for the work. But the thing we've got to keep in mind, it seems like, that Nehemiah is reminding us of, is that our God is greater mm -hmm. than any opposition. That's right. That's right. Um, God put us here for the work, and... and um, he never promised that we won't have it. Matter of fact, the promise was that we shall suffer some yeah. persecution. Uh, right. But he also describes to us, and I think that's very powerful, in that he describes that that, that, that um, opposition it and against the people all the time. And sometimes it's easier to point at the people mm -hmm. rather than pointing at the opposition itself. And the opposition between God um, is, is, the, is Satan and, and the right. devil. Uh, so... Um, amazing stories here for yeah. sure. And, and so these that are presented as enemies, they're uh, 
aligning themselves with the forces of darkness, mm -hmm. whether they know it or not. That's and right. that can happen today as That's well right. with right. opposition to a, a God work. That person can inadvertently, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter if they know it or not, be uh, lining themselves up with, with the forces of darkness. That's right. A absolutely. So um, I think it's interesting when we talk about open doors and closed doors that you, if, if you think that's clear, you might be tempted to say here in chapter 2 and verse 19, mm -hmm. oh, this isn't going to happen. It's a closed door. Mm -hmm. But Nehemiah just busts through the door with prayer and with action. Exactly, exactly. He, he stares it in the face. And, and we find that, um, I mean, Jesus himself uh, looked at it. You know, he, he understood the journey. He understood the calling. Uh, his prayer in the garden mm. certainly signifies that it wasn't easy, that, that, that he fully embraced and understood the gravity, uh, the weight that, that he was going to, to bear. But he, 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 he resolved with, not my will, but yours be done. And to me, that's almost ripping open the shirt letting this S <laughs> reveal itself that says, <laughs> I have now tapped into the powers of God. I'm no longer resting on my own will and my own ability, so I'm trusting in God. So when I see uh, Nehemiah resist Samballot, his responses and his letters back to them mm -hmm. as they were calling him away from the work, they were trying <laughs> to tempt him, he understood what they were doing and his responses to me, he didn't say it, but what he was saying was, is that I trust God and I'm not stopping this work. Right. And that was awesome. Yeah. In fact, there at one point he says, you're, you're just making this up. <laughs> right. Yeah. Over in chapter six, you're, that's you're right. inventing them in your own mind. That's I'm right. not coming down off this that's wall. Right. He's going to keep working. That's right. And that's an important leadership mm -hmm. principle as well. He was engaged mm -hmm. himself. Mm -hmm. He wasn't just uh, pointing uh, for people to do it. Mm -hmm. He was out there. Well, let's talk about the attitude, the importance of the right attitude also there in chapter 4 and uh, verse 6 as they get to building the wall and uh, it's joined to half its height, at least mm -hmm. there in chapter 4 and verse 6. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is the people had a mind to work. So we've talked a lot about action in That's Nehemiah, right. but you got to have the right mind for the work, don't you? That's right. That's right. Um, we're all men are created by God and for God. And, and to me, that sums it up. That sums it up that I'm not here for my own frivolous desires, but I'm here first for the desires of God. And mm -hmm. when I accept that calling, that's when I believe that we tap into, you know, Matthew 6 and 33, where, you know, if you seek these things, God will be with that. Why? It's because it started with your attitude. Your mm -hmm. attitude is that my talents and my resources are for God's purpose. Yes, I need to eat, so I probably need to get a secular job, but, but my blessings are to bless God because right. He is uh, where all blessings come from. So them having a mind to work to me sounds like they had the right recipe mm. for a success no matter what. It was yeah. going to work because, because they had a mind to work for God. They had the right mindset that That's then right. translated into the into the right actions. That's right. And uh, the, the work of their hands, mm. their physical hands, was because they were encouraged in the work, encouraged by themselves, mm -hmm. encouraged by the favor of God, That's not right. necessarily worrying about the, uh, 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 the opposition. That's right. I think uh, <laughs> that prayer in chapter 4, in verses 4 and 5, is, uh, is an honest prayer. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Jesus tells us to to pray for those who persecute us and love our enemies. But uh, this is such an important work. Mm -hmm. The walls representing their, their establishment, mm -hmm. their, their identity. Not mm -hmm. everyone's going to live within the walls, but, but it's such an important part of who they are that he's passionate that's about. Right. That's right. Uh, and and I, you're absolutely right. And, and that's, it's a powerful message in that when, we, when I hear his, his voice in understanding that you're talking about the enemy. Mm -hmm. so, so as he's writing back to them, he's basically speaking as Jesus did on the mountain in Matthew 4. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, you're asking me to do one thing, but that's in opposition to God. I'm mm -hmm. striking that down for mm -hmm. God. And so when he says, God, do these things, 
he, he's basically saying, devil, we're talking to you. That's right. You're not going to stop us. And, and so that um, strong word choice that he yeah. has there <laughs> is just motivation that uh, he, he's not talking to the people. He's talking to the enemy that's at work in those men. Mm. Mm -hmm. And leaders got to be able to discern that. That's right. That's and not right. compromise or acquiesce. And, that's right. Uh, and thus the work uh, right. slowed down. And, and Nehemiah has a great example on this mindset of, of the work over in chapter 5 and verse 16. He says, and I applied myself mm -hmm. to the work on this wall. Mm -hmm. And he's making adjustments even in his own mm -hmm. uh, uh, rights that he had that mm -hmm. he did not take full advantage of, very mm -hmm. much like Paul, mm -hmm. so that he can set the uh, example himself. Mm -hmm. So he's demonstrating the right attitude as well. That's right. Well, let's go over to uh, uh, later on in chapter 4, verses 9 through 20, where we have this incredible example, again, of Nehemiah praying, mm -hmm. but then they take up weapons. That's right. So it, it really shows us that you got to have prayer, mm -hmm. but also responsible actions. That's right. That's right. That's right. You can be um, wise as serpents and humble as doves at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you got to be watchful uh, that the enemy is still busy. You got to you got to um, you got to realize that the Lord left us here mm -hmm. to carry out the work. And and when we pray to Him, we trust that He give us the ability to do the work. You know, mm -hmm. He's God. He's going to do great great things, but He's doing great things through us. Mm -hmm. And and so we can't forget that piece where my prayer is that I hope that. God will move, literally move mountains out of the way so that I can walk on. Well, sometimes that mm -hmm. prayer could be, God, give me the strength to climb the mountain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Rather than watch. Exactly. Just and watch exactly. Yeah. And, and we've had those times in our study thus far of the Old Testament where God's given them the victory, but they're still moving out. That's right. Now, there's times when they get there and nothing happens because mm -hmm. he's already taken care of it. Mm -hmm. And it, even here in chapter 4 and verse 15, uh, God frustrates their plan. So we're trusting he's working behind the mm -hmm. scenes, mm -hmm. but we still got to do our part. That's right. That's and, right. Uh, it's not a 50-50 thing. It's That's full right. trust in God, but it's also being personally uh, responsible. So I'd, I'd like for you to speak to verses 13 and, and 14 about how the, the motivation of family comes into this aspect of, of responsible behavior. Uh, Nehemiah is really appealing uh, to mm -hmm. them as a family unit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, within the larger group. It, it's, it's amazing, and, and uh, his context um, speaks uh, much like the context of the, of the Word of God uh, and the context of leadership. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as leaders, we understand God's context uh, for, for Christianity is a family mm. element. Mm. Uh, we have responsibilities for each individual to, to um, make their calling and their election sure. Mm. That's, that's an individual right. thing. However, when we look at the dynamics of, of the way God set things in place, um, it's, it's very similar to the context of the church, the leadership structure and how mm. service is there. And we all work together as a unit to make the whole um, work. So here it's, it's amazing how um, the family of God comes together to protect each other, to serve each other, mm -hmm. to work with each other for the better good of, of what is supposed to be a community um, fortress. Mm -hmm. we're, we're all, we, have, we have a responsibility. I need my daughter praying for me. Mm -hmm. Just because I'm dad and I'm the leader of the home, doesn't mean I don't need her prayers. I need my daughter's prayers. I need my son's blessings. Mm -hmm. um, I need my wife's uh, motivation uh, to help me do the work, but they also need mine. And so we're working together to make the Bromfield household. Right. Um, uh, we protect each other from the enemy. We're, 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 we're needing each other to stay in the fight, and we need um, each other to to uh, accomplish God's will. I think he brought us together, much like he did here. Mm -hmm. He brought them all together for the purpose of getting the work done, so we need each other to do that. We really need to keep that biblical principle in mind of, of how God works through families. Mm -hmm. uh, the family concept comes under attack today. Mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, It's not really all that important, but uh, here's a great example in verses 
uh, 13 and 14, where it is a motivating factor. Do this fight for your family. That's right. Uh, yes, we're doing this as a community, larger community, but your family, your your wife, your daughters, That's right. uh, your sons, mm -hmm. your houses, mm -hmm. uh, do this. And of course, we know from later on with the post-exilic prophets that they had built up their houses mm -hmm. even while the walls were lying in ruins. That's so, right. okay, we know how important your, your home is, your mm -hmm. family is, mm -hmm. but now we've got this larger that's right. project that ties into that. And that, that's really true about the church today that's as well. That's exactly right. There's a connection. That's right. That's right. There's a pastor that say, <laughs> you know, you've, you've built up your houses while mine lay in, in ruins. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, the connotation is there. The connotation mm -hmm. is there. The responsibility is for us to work together um, as a home, and if I can't be responsible in my home to work together to be one unit, mm -hmm. then it's very difficult for me to do that for the church mm -hmm. because the church is comprised of families. There it is. That's right. The strength of our church is with the families. It's with the families. That's right. And uh, whatever the composition of that family is, that's right. But the principle being that what takes place at home does mm -hmm. impact the larger what community. What happens at the church? That's right. The, the church, our, our community uh, as a whole. But uh, because of this responsible effort, the prayer that came before that, then we see God is getting the credit for this mm -hmm. in, in verse 15, mm -hmm. as he should. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's after they were working with one hand and had the weapon in the other hand. And so there was, it doesn't seem like there's any arrogance in this passage on their part of, look what we did. No, um, it's, it's a, a bunch, it was opposite. It was a bunch of servitude. <laughs> they, they, they trusted that, that God was with Nehemiah. So when he began to speak, um, they did rise up a little bit and, and they were discouraged. Um, uh, but he, he spoke again. And, and as though they said, you're right, you have the voice of God with you. And so they submitted themselves to his voice, to his message. They called their families together. They said, it's just not men doing this work or one dynamic doing this work. We're all doing this work together. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was, a, it was a bunch of servitude in this. There was no arrogance. Yeah. And when they needed swords, they had swords. And when they needed spears, they had spears. But when they needed a hammer, they all had hammers as well. And that was a beautiful thing to watch. Yeah. Yep. So as we uh, wrap, begin to wrap this up, as, as you think about all these leadership principles in Nehemiah, uh, what would you say is the most important one for the church today, or, or maybe a couple of them that you really think are important for where we are as a church, uh, to, not just Sylvan Hills, but just the, the church in general? Uh, what, what are some of the things that Nehemiah is really saying to us today? Yeah, great. Uh, thank you for, for that question. Um, I think that Nehemiah is pulling out three things. Uh, first is, is that it starts from the beginning. He asked the question. Mm. He asked the question. And I began to think about my own life and how often have I asked a question where I really didn't want to know the answer. Okay. Um, but in our walk, in our, in our, in our lives, um, we have to ask the question, Lord, what is it? that you have for me to do. Mm -hmm. And it was clear that he was praying that prayer night and day. Lord, what is it that you have me to do? But when God spoke the answer, mm -hmm. he, he heeded what God said and went to work. So first thing is you gotta ask the question. The second thing is that you must be willing to do the work. Mm. Um, so I don't know if Nehemiah had some <laughs> predisposition about what was going on based on the small response that he got from his brother who said the work is great there. Did he fully understand? Did he fully mm. comprehend what he was about to get in? Or was it that when he trusted God, it didn't matter the depth mm. of the work. Okay. It didn't matter the depth of the work. God said, go do it. I'll be with you. That's what he planted in his heart. Mm. The work could have been amazingly tough, but Nehemiah knew that if he could go and do what God had asked him to do and God was with them, that no matter the work, it could be done. The next is, the final thing, is that the people had a mind to work. So, so the question was asked, they had, they had uh, Nehemiah was accepted the challenge to do the work, mm -hmm. but gathering the people together, 
that everybody had a mind to work and that was the blessing mm -hmm. that we can accomplish everything that God has in store for us to do when he called Jesus to sit at his right side. Mm -hmm. Jesus' work was finished and Jesus said, Lord, I have finished what you asked me to do. Now, each individual that's been left behind for the purpose of doing God's business, we too must be able to call out to God, God, I have finished what you have asked for me to do. And in order for us to do that, we have to have a mind yeah. to work. To work. Yep. Yeah, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, he created us That's in Christ right. Jesus mm -hmm. for good works. For good works. And uh, I, I mentioned a couple of times about the diversity of people that are working mm -hmm. in chapter 3. Even mm -hmm. the perfumers are, <laughs> are working. And we got priests and high priests and goldsmiths and everyone. And that's really a good picture of the, of the body of Christ. There's, there's something for us all. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just need to put our minds to it mm -hmm. and uh, work together on it and give God the glory. I, I love chapter 1 and verse 5, mm -hmm. uh, one of his eight prayers where he is crying out to the God of heaven, the great and awesome God. And that's, that's right. the same God that's that we right. serve today Amen. who is willing to bless us beyond measure. That's right. When we have the mind to work and do the that's work. That's right. Yesterday, the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Amen. He does not change. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, brother, for being with us and uh, giving us a good taste of what's in Nehemiah with so much more there. I hope that our study has been beneficial to you mm -hmm. and appreciate you joining us for this study. Mm -hmm.